establishing his will and his purpose for your lives in Jesus' name. So after the service, please don't run away. Just wait behind somewhere in the front row. Somebody will come and talk with you. Shall we pray together? Dear Lord, speak to us this morning again and let your word make sense and meaning to us. Let your word bring transformation. Let your word bring healing. Let your word bring deliverance. Let your word bring inspiration. Let your word bring breakthrough to us. For in Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen. And the living church says, amen. What is the meaning of amen? So shall it be. When you say it shabbily or not convincingly, it only tells me that you don't want what I've prayed about or what whoever prayed, prayed about to be. So in Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen. We are intelligent people, so we know what it means. So let's act as those who know what it means. Say it enthusiastically. Don't say it like idiosically. Uh, I am not the type that will tell you as loud as your amen is, so shall your blessing be. No, that's not true. Or shout until the roof blows up before God can hear. That's not true. But there should be that sound of conviction from your heart. And it's an encouragement to everyone. And the Lord will continue to bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Job chapter 1. Job chapter 1. Does that ring a bell? Are you wondering why is pastor talking from Job on the last Sunday of September? Okay. And the month of September is a very special month for my family too. Because uh, on the 22nd was the day my first child was born. And I, each time that day comes, I remember the battle God helped us to win. So the young man turned 15 on Friday. And that's Mr. Judu Mukoro. Celebrate God for us. Uncle uh -uh. will be celebrate God for me. And I want to welcome back the Ikeobis. Um, I'm welcome myself back. Sorry, I forgot to announce I was going on leave. Uh, I had to go because the pressure was getting to my body. So I had to just escape and take care of myself a little bit. And thank you for understanding and for praying for me. And for allowing me to rest. The Lord will bless you and give you rest also in Jesus' name. Amen. Alright, Job chapter 1, verses 6 to 12. And then we'll skip to verses 20 to 22. Are you there with me now? One day, the angels came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan also came with them. The Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, From roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Verse 10. I mean verse 9. Does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied. Have you not put an edge around him and his household and everything he has? You have blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. But now, somebody say but now. Stretch out your hand and strike everything he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, Very well then, everything he has is in your power. Bet on the man himself. Do not lay a finger. 20. At this, Job got up and tore his robe and shaved his head. Then he fell to the ground in worship and said, Naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I will depart. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. In all this, 
Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. Move with me quickly to chapter 2 from verse 1. On another day, the angels came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan also came with them to present himself before him. And the Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord from roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. And the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. And he still maintains his integrity, though you incited me against him to ruin him without any reason. Skin for skin, Satan replied. A man will give all he has for his own life. But now stretch out your hand and strike his flesh and bones. And he will surely curse you to your face. Verse 6. Then the Lord said to Satan, Very well then, he is in your hands, but you must spare his life. May the Lord bless the reading of his words into our hearts in Jesus' name. The joy of spiritual worship, stability. Somebody say stability. Say it again, stability. Uh, where are the structural engineers in this place? Okay. Is there an extra mic? Because he's going to preach with me this morning. Structural engineers, Uncle Henry, Adiola, please come. What of uh, architects or no, the architects now or civil engineers? Any civil? Is it same? Eh? Oh, structural is even as civil. Uh, eh? It's a branch of civil engineering. Okay, so if you belong to all the branches of civil engineering, come. <laughs> uh -uh. Only one. Uncle, you forget. Can I have the other mic? I hope it's working. Where's the other mic? Uh -huh. Brother Macri, please come. Listen, church, I want you to pay attention to what these people are going to be talking about this morning. We are dealing with the issue of stability. I just want them to illustrate a point for us. Okay, I'm going to put you on the spot now. Brother Macri, when we talk about stability, what comes to your mind? Ability to stand. Ability to stand. And withstand pressure. Eh? And withstand pressure. And withstand pressure. Ability to stand and withstand pressure. In other words, if you can stand but cannot withstand pressure, there is no stability or you are not stable. Okay. Brother Wons, how does how do we test stability? Okay. We test stability by when you have, okay, like we start with um, reinforcement. Um, you're doing your reinforcement. You must make sure that the re reinforcement agents like the rods um, are of good quality. Okay, sorry, maybe I should reframe this. How do I ensure, how do I test to make sure, to see that this thing I've done is stable? Wow. Uh, for you to test it, you must make sure that the measurement is fair. And when you, you know, uh, fix all of them together, then you find out that uh, it's going to stay for the test of time. Okay, uncle is diplomatic. <laughs> Let me ask uh, uncle Adiola here. How do we test the stability of a structure. Yeah. Uh, testing comes to what you know that that structure will be subjected to. Okay. So let's give us an example. One, the structure must be able to stand the forces acting on it. Whether it be wind, 
load pressure of any kind. Okay, uh, I see one. Are you in the field? Why did you sit down? Is it because you are still a student? Come here. The Lord calls those things that are not as though they what? Yeah. Sin against you as a child of God determines how stable your faith is. And one thing I can tell you without any doubt is every worshiper of God is a stable person. Every true worshiper. Thank you, uncle. I got your voice from here. Every true worshiper. You know, Jesus said there are those who worship what they don't know. But the Bible says, Jesus said, now is the time when the worshipers, the true worshipers, will worship in spirit and in what? In truth. And those who worship in spirit and in truth, who are the true worshipers, are stable people. Tell your neighbor, if you are a true worshiper, your stability is guaranteed. Now let's look at the life of Job. In verse 1 of chapter 1, multimedia, help me. What did the Bible say? It said there was a man in a city called Oz or Uz, whichever one you want. This man, his name was what? Job. You know, the engineers have helped me. I want you to help me now. His name was who? Job. Where did he live? Where was he living or where did he live? In Oz. Eh? Now look at the qualities that were used to describe this man. Number one is what? Number two? Number three? And number four? Are these not the qualities of a true worshiper? Are they? What is blameless? Blameless speaks to his actions as seen by men. There, are, there is nothing you, he, will, he will do that you will find fault in. Many of us are here who will say, I don't care what people think about me. But I tell you, the assessment of men matters. So when the Bible says he was blameless, he was saying, look, if you Evaluate the actions of this man. Heaven and earth can testify that there is no fault in his actions. Two, he was what? Upright. What does it mean to be upright? Okay, look at the two words put together. Up and right. What does it mean to be up? To be upright. To be standing straight tall. The way I'm standing. I am standing upright. Is it not? When you look at a goal post. You see two uprights and one bar. Is it not? Now if I am standing like this. Am I standing upright? Church. I am not. What of like this? I am still not upright. Good. That speaks to his integrity. His words, his thoughts, his motives, his actions are in sync. If he says it's black, it's black. If he tells you I love you and you have the capacity to look into his heart and see the quality and the content of his heart, what you will find is that he really, really loves you. If he tells you I don't like what you have done and you look into his heart, what you will find is the disgust for that thing that you have done. He doesn't say yes and mean no. And doesn't say no and mean yes. In his ways, he was straightforward. He was not crooked. Number three. The Bible says he feared God. He feared God. Who is a man that fears the Lord? How do you know a man who fears God? A man who trembles at his words. A man who does not joke with what God says. A man who does not twist the words of God. The man who does not, I mean, try to manipulate his ways when God says something. His life is all about God. 
And lastly, the Bible called him a what? A man who shunned evil. As I was reading this over the past two weeks, I began to ask myself some questions. For myself, not for you. And so, the passion with which I'm preaching this message is the passion with which I received it. He shunned evil. Do you know what it means to shun? I mean, if you know what it means to shun. Auntie Christy, can you come? Today is all of us. I'm just coming from rest. I'm still trying to conserve my energy. Auntie Christy, I want you to act in a way to shun me. What is your own? Why are you laughing? My auntie is beautiful. So, and if she shuns me, I will understand. Auntie Christy, Auntie Christy, please, I want to talk to you. Auntie Christy, I'm talking to you, please. Auntie C. That hurts. Now, please come back eh, and don't show me this time. <laughs> don't worry, you can take your seat. Thank you so much. Don't worry, take your seat. Thank you. You saw that? How many of you would like that? You know, what God is saying is, if a wealthy man came to Job with some beautiful proposals, as soon as Job discovers that this is a wicked man, the way Auntie Christy treated me, that's the way Auntie uh, Job treats that person. He doesn't have anything to do with evil. He will not tolerate it. He will not do it. He will not celebrate it. He will not tacitly approve of it. You know, sometimes we don't do it. We don't speak against it. We, we are quiet about it. And you know, in English they say, Silence is what? Silence is what? Silence is what? Yes, so if you see somebody doing something wrong and you are in a position to correct and you keep quiet, you are already giving an approval. We call it tacit approval. Job will not do that. And God saw this in this man. Little wonder, God will speak from heaven and tell Satan, have you seen my servant, Job? Can God say of joy, have you seen my servant, joy? As beautiful as that is, it comes with test. And that's where the issue of stability comes. It's a beautiful thing to be a true worshiper, but you will be tested. It's a beautiful thing to profess Jesus, but your profession and confession of faith will be tested. Will it stand? Job was not privy to the information we have. Job not hear that conversation we have for heaven when Jesus, when angels, they gather. Can you imagine? Oh, some of us think that Satan cannot come to church, right? Is that not? Some of us used to think that Satan not the entire God house. Ah, ah, blessed power of God, not in that place. How Satan went that day? These meetings that took place, the two meetings we read, where did they take place? Where did the Bible say they took place? In the presence of God. The angels in their white robes were all gathered, probably about to have a conference like we'll have later. And who was there? Call the name. Satan, the Bible did not say evil man. It says Satan was also there. You know, the world is a combination of good and evil. Light and darkness. Hunger and satisfaction. Negative and positive. That's what makes the balance. So even when everybody is praising you, there is going to be that dissenting voice. And so when God boasted of Job and said, have you seen my servant? That there is no one like him. Multimedia give us verse 6 and and Satan laughed. You know that I have worked in the hospital where a woman abandoned her husband in the hospital. This was a man that was wealthy. And then he got hit by diabetes, hypertension, renal issues. I mean, multiple issues at the same time. 
and he was admitted. And this man was ebbing away. After the while, the woman ran away. And this was a woman they have been together for quite some time when the man had means. What did the Bible say? There is no one like him. Verse, seven, verse 9. Give us verse 9. What did Satan say? Church, read it. Now, if Satan were to ask God, do you think this person is worshipping you for nothing? Not be because you gave a job last time. God, forget that thing. <laughs> Who they worship you? You know they worship you. When you don't protect everything when you get. Next verse. What did he say? Ten. You have done what? Put an edge. Of course, God protects his own. Next, you have also done what? Bless his work. Yes, God prospers his own. But the protection and the blessing is not the main thing in our relationship with God. Those are the things Jesus calls these other things shall be added. Those are additions. But many of us have turned those additions to the mainstay of our worship. And that's why people run from pillar to post today. They say, if your church not change you, change your church. And when they say change you, it's not your spiritual life. Oh. It's mainly about your physical life. Money, job, wife, all those things. That's the thing they're talking about. You have been praying for a child for many years and you are in a church and it's not working. Say, come to my church. In a month's time, you have a child. Oh, you've been work, looking for a job all these years. If you come to my church, you will get the job. Are those things important? Yes. But they are not the mainstay of our lives. Bible says a man's life is not consistent in the amount of things that he possesses. Next verse, he says, now stretch forth your hand. Verse 11. And touch those things. Multimedia, are you still with me? Or oh, you have been caught up? Are they there now? Read, church. Want to go? How many of us have, cost, have not cursed God? How many of us have not had reasons to doubt God? How many of us have not had reasons to question whether God still loves us because we were faced with challenges? Stretch out your hand. And strike everything. And interestingly in verse 12. God did not even think twice. Can you imagine that? Without any questioning of Satan. Without even trying to at least defend Job so to speak. He just said. Very well then. Everything he has is where? In your power. But there is something else. Don't touch that man. Hallelujah. No, no. You don't understand it. There is no... Satan does, Satan does not have the capacity or the temerity to cross the limits that God places. There is a boundary. Tell your neighbor there is a boundary. Many of us don't know this. That's why we are afraid. God has set a boundary... God has set an edge. God has set protection around me. The devil cannot go beyond where God has said he should go to. And that's why the scripture says, you should not be afraid that you will not be tested above that which you are able. But in every temptation, God will do what? Will make a way of escape. Very well then. Go ahead. And Satan did very well. In a split in less than 24 hours, Everything that Job has that was described in verse 2 of chapter 1 to down was taken off. But the testimony is in verse 20. Verse 20. At this, when the news of all the calamities came to him, 
when the last man standing had delivered his own message of evil and wrong, I mean ruin and destruction that the devil had done, the Bible says Job did what? Got up. That is the position of a man who worships God. Problems don't pull us down. They cause us to stand. The Bible says if in the days of battle you faint, your strength is small. He did what? He got up first of all and tore his robe, shaved his head, and then he stood up to tell the devil, you have not won. But what did he do next? He fell down before the Lord in submission. When you are struck with something you don't understand, don't let it beat you down. Stand in your faith and bow in worship to your God. Hallelujah. The Bible says, he fell on his face and worshipped. What do you think Job was saying then? The Bible gave us an inkling of what is part of what, I don't think that's all he said, though, but probably that's the summary. Because I know Job will have a lot to tell God. Abby, don't you think so? He will have a lot to tell God that, but <laughs> the Bible gave us just a snippet of what he said. He said what? Number one, naked I came. Is that not true? How many of you were born <laughs> as the doctors or nurses that took delivery where they saw dollars in this hand, saw khaki on this hand, saw house key on that hand as we were coming out? Is there anyone like that? Anyone like that? If they told you that's the way you were born, will you believe it? So that's the reality. We came naked. And naked we depart. In the course of this last week, I could see why I brought something up in our MME platform and I was laughing. <laughs> they are building duplexes as coffins. Um, they, you know, well, in part of the world, you see all kinds of things. I was in Ghana for a while. <laughs> so we saw all kinds of things. Uh, they will build duplexes. They will put speakers and Bluetooth players inside coffin. They will build aeroplanes as coffin. Even mobile phone as coffin. Anything shape you want, they can build for you as your coffin. <laughs> but it's useless. Because once the spirit departs, everything else is useless. And when that spirit is departing, does it drag your account with it? Eh? How many of you have seen a man who died and the day he died, his account details or the funds in his account was wired to where he was going to. Have you seen that before? It doesn't happen. How many of you have seen a man die and he says, this house key, this is my key that I cherish. And we men love their cars a lot. This car that my wife cannot even drive. He take the key for nobody. Have you seen it before? You see that? That's why the Bible tells us that. And Job said, naked I came, naked I will go. The Lord gave one principle of stewardship. There is nothing you have that you were not given. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May his name be what? I didn't hear that. May his name be May his name be May his name be Scripture says in all circumstances give thanks to the Lord. <laughs> Beloved, God has not called us to be wishy-washy Christians. Many of us today, either by default or by exposure, tend to think that because I am a worshiper of God, I am immune to the challenges of life. And you boast of how stable you are, how spiritual you are, when things are okay. And the moment trouble strikes, all of that fizzles away, you are unstable. You can sing and shout hallelujah when all things are going well with you. But that hallelujah disappears at the sight of trouble.
Jesus, you are so good to me. You know, if you don't believe it, don't sing it. On, on December 31st, 2022, a date we will never forget in our history. That day looked as if God had abandoned us. Interestingly, it was going to be watch night service. One of the young men that was with me stood and we were here when we were praying when that incident was going on. News of the first one came, the second one, the third one, the fourth one, the fifth one. And the young man looked at me and said, Pastor, are we going to have crossover service? I said, yes. Because tomorrow morning, the sun will still rise. Did the sun rise? He looked at me again and said, how are you going to tell the church this thing? I said, the Lord who made it happen will give me the wisdom to communicate it. One of the, one of the most valuable calls I've ever received in the course of these past few years of turmoil came from one of our uncles here. And it was just a one-word statement. I mean, a one-sentence statement. The pastor, don't worry. God is in control. He's looking at me. He didn't know how powerful that statement was for me that particular time. In tough times, in difficulty, that's when you know whether you are stable or not. You don't test the stability of a substance by exposing it to mere, mere things. You subject it to rigorous testing. When your test comes, I said when, not if, is when. When your test comes, will you stand? As a true worshiper, you are stable. Preach it to your neighbor. As a true worshiper, you are stable no matter what. And that's why, what do you find in those passages? Number one, heaven acknowledged Job's stability. God did not make that statement frivolously. I don't think that what Job went through was the first test of his life. God has been watching the man. He had that kind of quality like those of Noah. Remember Noah? In the generation of where the whole world was an anti-God, the Bible says Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. He was of the lineage of Enoch in a time when people didn't know what it meant to have a relationship with God. The Bible says Enoch walked with God. He was a man after the order of Daniel. The same lineage with Daniel. When we are told that when all the affairs of the government of Daniel were brought and checked, they could not find any single ash, um, act with which to indict him. Beloved, you are a worshiper of God. But when your books are opened, what shall we find? When your testing comes, will you still be a true worshiper? You know the interesting part? <laughs> In that second chapter, I intentionally added that to it. Verse 6. Look at verse 6. I want you to take note of verse 6 very well before we, as we go. He said, the Lord said to Satan, this is the second time after destroying everything he has, now he's going for his person, his, his, his body. You know, they say when there is life, there is what? Hope. Now look at this. Look at verse 6. The Lord said to Satan, very well then, 
He is in your hand, but you must do what? Church, I didn't hear that. You must. Now the question is, so what is life? His children are gone. His wealth gone. Even his body is failing. So, what is life? When the Americans talk about the good life, what are they talking about? When you talk about the good life, what are you talking about? The good life. Everything is working. You have a good car. You have a good house. You have a beautiful spouse. You have beautiful children. You have a good job. Everything is rosy. That's the good life for some people. But here the Bible says, even his body is in your hand, but don't touch his life. I need to go and answer, answer that question. What is life to me? Because the answer to that question forms the basis for everything else you do in life. What is life? Beloved, true worshippers are stable people and heaven acknowledges them. They are stable people and they are free from the bondage of mammon. That's why Job, after losing everything he has labored for, in less than 24 hours, could still say, may his name be praised. That's why he could still confess, though he slays me, yet will I trust him. What is the condition upon which you're worshipping God? What is the basis of your worship? Worshippers are stable people because they are firm-footed in the day of storm. In fact, storm makes them stronger. Mama, okay. God bless you, ma. Mama, ha Mama Woke has beautiful plantains in her compound. And at intervals, she will call me and say, my son, send driver come collect plantain. And she will send me plantains. Beautiful, organic plantain without fertilizer. But what there was this day, I went to see her and she said, Pastor, yesterday breeze gone blue. Oh, my plantain. What did you put to them? Fell, fell, fell. <laughs> All the plantain in the compound fell. But there was one tree in that compound. What is the name of that tree? That tree, where did your compound? It's plantain. No, the other tree, that big one. Where would they sit down for under? Ukwa. Not be Ukwa. 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 There is an Ukwa tree. In that compound. With all the wind that blew all the plantain away, the ukwa tree is there. Why? It's rooted. And that takes us to the point that Brother Martins was making. What are you made of? Your components will determine whether you will stand in the day of storm. What are you rooted on? If you are rooted on wealth, when wealth disappears, you go down. If you are rooted on fame, when fame disappears, you will go down. If you are rooted on money, when money leaves, you will disappear. If you are rooted on your spouse, when your spouse leaves, you will fall. But there is a rock. Hallelujah. The Bible says, upon this rock, I will build my church. When my heart is overwhelmed, please lead me to the rock. He set my feet on the rock to stay. And that rock is who? Jesus. When you are firmly rooted in Jesus, no matter how hot or tough the storm is, when it's over, you will be like that building Jesus talked about. The wind blew, 
The rain fell. The flood came. Beat against the house. Yet it was standing. Because his foundation was on the rock. What is your foundation? What is your foundation? What are you built on? What are you standing on? What is your hope resting on? My faith has found a resting place. Not in device, nor creed. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All of the ground is sinking sand. All of the ground is sinking sand. Young people who are preparing to go to the university. There's a storm awaiting you. A storm of identity crisis is awaiting you. A storm of the pressure to make it by all means is awaiting you. The storm of sexual immorality is awaiting you. But what are you founded on? What are you sitting on? What are you resting on? That will determine whether you will stand or you will crumble. So your life, if it's not rooted in Jesus, you will go down. But as a true worshiper, there can be no other foundation. So beloved, as we round up this month, I need you to take time to go back into all the Lord has been telling us about worship. And make your life a testimony of Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you by the mercies of God that you offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your act of reasonable worship. Don't worship with just your mouth. Don't worship with just your when, when things are okay. Let it flow from the very depth of that which you are rooted in. And that is Christ Jesus. As we round up, a life of worship is a stable life. A life of true worship is a stable life. Stability, however, is tested by storms and other forces that have one singular purpose to topple you. But what you are made of, what you are rooted on, is crucial to your stability. In these days and in these times, when worship has become just a flamboyant uh, event with lights, smokes, all kinds of artificial things, and we say we are worshiping, it's time for you to begin to ask yourself the critical question, can this kind of worship help me to stand when I am faced with crisis. This kind of worship that is only in the public, but in the privacy, you are something else. That kind of worship cannot stand the test. Worship, true life of worship, or life of true worship, has both depth and a very broad base. The depth is on the root in Christ Jesus. The base is broadened by discipleship and obedience to the word of God. Hallelujah. If you have not subjected yourself to both, you are missing out. But from the life of Job, you see the blessings of being a stable believer. You see the blessings of being a stable worshiper. Heaven will acknowledge you. You are free from the bondage of mammon. You are firm-footed in the day of storm. The question is, are you a worshiper? Check your stability. By your heart as we pray. Take a few minutes to examine yourself. Am I truly a worshiper? What storms have shaken your roots? What are those things that you have considered as your life? To him that overcome it, that means you will fight battles. To him that endures to the end, that means there will be difficult times. 
haven't done all to stand, that means there is a battle to fight. Lord, I want to be standing when all is done. You want to make a fresh commitment to a life of true worship this morning. I want you to rise with me as we sing the song, I am dying, O oh Lord. That's going to be our prayer this morning. I am yours, O oh Lord. I have heard the voice. And he told thy love to me, how much you care about me. But I long to rise in the arm of faith. And be closer drawn to thee. I am dying, oh Lord. I, I have heard the voice, voice, and it told thy Lord to, to me. me. Lord, draw me nearer. Draw me nearer. Oh, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross. Help me to understand it, Lord. Jesus, draw me nearer. That commitment to the Lord in a word of prayer. Lord, I commit to being a true worshiper. I commit to being a true worshiper. Circumstances will not change my commitment, Lord. I need the grace to stand that my commitment to you is not conditioned on good seasons alone. That even in hard times, in tough experiences of life, I will remain somebody that you can boast about like you did boast about Job. That when the test of life come and all the things around me are stripped away, I will still be standing. Oh God, help me. Help me, Lord. I need thee every hour, most gracious Lord. No tender voice like, like that can peace, can peace out. I need thee. I need Father, behold your children who are standing before you this morning, making a fresh commitment to a life of worship, a life of true worship, a life of depth, a life rooted in you, a life like that of Job that was said that he was blameless, he was upright, he feared you, and he shunned the evil. Lord, the grace to do this by the help of your Holy Spirit release upon these ones in the name of Jesus. That Lord, you will look into our congregation and find men, women, youths who are sold out to you. Whether they are in church or in, on the campus, whether they are in their offices or in the marketplace, 
wherever they go, Lord, they will be worshippers and they will be a source of worship unto you. Lord, we pray. As many who are buckling, who are breaking down under the pressure, under the weight of the challenges of the world, who are rethinking their commitment, let these words re-energize them this morning. Many who are cringing on their commitment, many who are beginning to shake in their commitment on account of our economic situation, Lord, strengthen them this morning in the name of Jesus. Father, from generation to generation, you are the same. You are the God of the mountain. You are also God in the valley. You are the God in the day. You are also God in the night. And so when we go through our ninth time, you are still God. When we go through the day, you are still God. When we face our mountain experiences, you are still God. When we go through our deep experiences and low moments of life, you are still God. Help us to focus on you at all times. Because we know and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Lord, help us to turn our eyes on you this morning. As we go into the last week of this month, in preparation for the month of October, we are trusting in your wisdom, we are trusting in your grace to carry us through. You will bring us into the month of October with rejoicing and celebration to the glory and praise of your name. Thank you for your healing upon our sister and upon our brother who are down in health. Thank you for that person's job that you have secured. Thank you for speaking for them in the management committee. Thank you because of that joy you are bringing to that family that have always been in so much disarray. Thank you for your healing that you are bringing upon our nation. We know our eyes will see it and our mouth will testify to your goodness. To you be all the praise as we go this week. For in Jesus' name we have prayed. Thank you for our brothers who are worshipping with us for the first time. We ask, oh Lord, that in this place, they will grow. They will experience a new dimension in their spiritual walk. To your praise and to your glory. And as we go into the church in conference, Holy Spirit, take control.